Okay. Welcome, everybody. How are you doing? How are you doing? Okay. Not good. Not good? I'm sorry to hear that. What's going on today, William? She's, no, the semester cannot end. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're here together. We... <laughs> so today, we're going to have our last meeting like this. The next meeting that I'll have with you will... Actually, we'll have... Um, the next meeting we'll have is going to be uh, just kind of work on your projects meeting on a week from today. And then the next meeting after that is going to be presentation time. Are we going back to like both sections in the same room presentation? Yes, we will. We will. We will. Okay. We will. Um, today, what I'd like to talk to you about are a series of projects that we've pursued in our lab over time that involve what we'll call fluid soft material interaction. We'll talk a little bit about airfoils, we'll talk about rotary actuators, and we'll talk about jellyfish. And you'll see some of the simulations that we performed in attempting to do fluid structure interaction uh, modeling, okay? And in some cases, these works are what you would consider unfinished or unpolished, okay? They were polished adequately to submit a master's thesis, a ma or master's theses, okay? Um, but in, in reality, we never got around to submitting actual manuscripts to journals for some of these things, okay? So hopefully, you'll get an idea of what might still be out there and, and what we've accomplished in this area, okay? And I'd like to thank the students that you see listed here. I believe there are even others that were helping them through the years that we did this work, okay? So here's kind of an overview. This is more of a current uh, overview of the types of things that we're doing in our lab. And uh, we work on skin like sensors still. We look, work on biosensors. Uh, we work on uh, robots, uh, mostly for scrubbing now. And we do a decent amount of work with atmospheric plasmas. And we're interested in disinfection and sanitization. But before we started working on some of the things, or while we worked on some of these, like skin like sensing and touch and force, we're not doing that too, too much anymore, to be honest. Um, but uh, in fact, maybe not really, uh, I can't think of someone who's really dedicated to that now in our lab. But, um, but what I'm going to show you is some of the stuff that happened when I first got to Rutgers. And, um, in, in some respects, it took off, but didn't take off, and maybe we'll also talk about some of the lessons I've learned. So, back, 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 like 2009, I got exposed to this area of soft robotics and soft actuation. And what you see here are some uh, figures that were on some journal articles that I had the privilege to kind of be a contributor. To, to getting out, all right? So in this case, we created these pneumatic actuators that can pick up an egg or pick up an anesthetized mouse. And, and then I think I have a little bit more, okay, yeah, I have, uh, so this was uh, a video that Philip Ilyeski produced. And back in 2009, this was a pretty big deal, okay? This was pretty exciting. We have many, many degrees of freedom possible based on the contour of the object you're trying to pick up. And you have only one input that is pressurized air. Okay. And then Rob Shepard, who's now at Cornell, so Phil Bielieski did great. He was a postdoc uh, in, in white size group. And he went off to work for Phillips. Uh, Rob Shepard came along, picked up the projects, and uh, he's now a professor at Cornell. He's doing very well. And this was uh, his, his uh, significant contribution. So instead of one bladder with one input, he created uh, a soft actuator that had multiple bladders in multiple locations, and we were able to, to help crawl. My contribution, um, 
I was involved in the, uh, in the pneumatic system that was controlled by LabVIEW that did some of the automated um, actuation, all right, so off, off screen. Actually, I guess we're all off screen here, okay? But Rob really pioneered this work. So from, from these beginnings, I got to come to Rutgers and started looking at a couple of different, actually a few different areas where we might apply uh, pneumatics and the use of elastomers. Has anyone used or molded silicone? No, okay. So polydimethylsiloxane, all right, is a form of silicone and it will change your life if you start to use this in a research setting. All right. it, it has a very low surface energy it's uh, non-toxic, don't drink it, but it is, uh, it is a wonderful material. Okay? It's very transparent, and um, you can mold it quite easily off of a 3D printed uh, mold, uh, part. Okay? So uh, I, I spent time looking at how bubbles were, how we could evacuate bug bubbles from uh, molded components in, in PDMS. And then I got an opportunity to work as a postdoc, not in microfluidics where I was initially starting, but in the area of soft robotics and also in paper-based electronics. So at Rutgers, we kind of came in and actually did too many things probably at the same time, but uh, continued to work in this area of soft robots and also worked in paper-based electronics. More funding came in for paper-based electronics then came in for soft robotics, so soft robotics ended up kind of taking a back seat. But I'll tell you some of the things that we did do and the things that I was excited about at that, at these, uh, in, this, in, this, in this time period. So here is kind of this idea for a jellyfish, all right? But generally speaking, what I was attempting to think about longer term was how we could conceive new designs, fabricate them, characterize them, and at the same time work on simulation and see if we could evolve these designs, okay? And then potentially see how multiple versions of these designs could work together as swarms. This is pretty aggressive, okay? And even now, I'm not sure I have all the skills to do every part of this, but we've had Multiple students work on multiple aspects of trying to achieve different parts of these, these objectives. And when it comes to jellyfish, these bio-inspired machines could match what you see with some eels or fish or jellyfish. Okay? Um, I'll show a graph, I think, in a, in a slide or two. I kind of threw this together, so it's not the most polished presentation, but that's okay, you're used to that. Um, and when it comes to jellyfish, in 2014, there was a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, by Gamel and Dabiri and Priya, that suggested that, and, and still suggests that the most efficient swimmer for its size is the jellyfish. In particular, the moon jellyfish, Arita Aurelia, okay? And so we got on the idea, and, and it turns out that besides them, I don't know why many people, I mean, there, there ended up being multiple uh, jellyfish-based robots, but I mean, I haven't looked very carefully at this point, but my understanding is still, no one has created a jellyfish-based robot, or any robot for that matter, that matches the low cost of transport, which is akin to efficiency, for these living animals. All right, so this is an open challenge, I believe, unless, they've, unless anyone's achieved it in their lab. And so, <laughs> scientifically, <laughs> or actually kind of even more aggressively, we thought, well, if one jellyfish is really efficient, would it be possible that multiple jellyfish, like swarms of jellyfish, right? And you have these blooms of jellyfish out in the ocean, which are causing some issues. Um, 
And uh, is it possible they would be more efficient swimming together? And that hypothesis, I'm pretty sure, has not been tested thoroughly by anyone at this point. Okay. And um, what we did know, though, is that the living jellyfish would create starting and stopping vortices. Okay. And we were thinking further, complete, not completely tested yet, all right, that we might be able to manipulate the gait, all right, so how fast, how slow you, you flap the bell of a jellyfish to be able to affect its efficiency, okay? Um, and applications, we're talking about manipulating objects underwater. Okay, I'll show you some of like our take on how you could potentially do this, at least with maneuverability. It's more about maneuverability for our, we weren't like picking up objects and things, okay? Um, this has been something that ONR has funded. Uh, I don't know how far they got, but they did, they did fund the company working to um, create like a buoy that was jellyfish inspired to be able to collect uh, data. And uh, maybe also I'll show you some comic like uh, drawings that we did for being able to um, maybe uh, rescue or, or assist in, um, in, uh, in helping people <laughs> in case they, they got into trouble, okay? So this is kind of uh, a general roadmap. This is a zoomed in picture on in terms of what we were thinking about with jellyfish. And I'll, I'll show you some of the different aspects. We did, we did work pretty much in all of these aspects except for swarms. We didn't get to swarms. Now, here's an interesting graph that describes what's called the cost of transport versus mass, okay? Cost of transport is how much energy is required to go a meter divided by the mass. And in this case, it's the, the wet mass, right? So a jellyfish, you don't dehydrate it and then measure its mass. You say, hey, let's, it's wet, let's go ahead and, and see um, how much mass it has and, and, and how far will it go for the amount of respired energy that it requires. Okay, so uh, this was, Remus, okay, was a, I'm guessing still exists, um, a kind of an underwater uh, vehicle. Okay, that you could use for exploration, unmanned. And then Yemo, yeah, Daviri, and all of them, they, have, they, have, they, have, they didn't put the Remus on there. Okay? Um, they didn't put this estimate for swarms. Okay? This was some estimate that we made. But they did put all the other data that you see here. Okay? So do you see this? At small volumes, the jellyfish has the lowest cost of transport. Okay, small masses. Lower than swimming fish, lower than flying, lower than running, okay? Look at the slope of these lines, though. If you extend the swimming jellyfish out, like, you know, and it's parallel to this estimate for swarms, right? If you swim, if you, once you get to something that's like 30, 40, 50 kilograms, okay, then swimming fish are going to dominate. Okay, they're going to be more efficient. And it turns out that swimming fish in general, has anyone ever, well, uh, I guess I'll show you some jellyfish swimming in a second. But has anyone ever been to the aquarium and seen jellyfish? Yes. Do they move very quickly? No, all right? So we're talking about efficiency, not speed, okay? And, uh, and so if you are a whale, you're better to swim with a fin then you are off trying to flap like a jellyfish, okay? And so nature has taken that direction. And it, it's pretty remarkable that your cost of transport goes up with size in all these cases, okay? So as you make it larger, I mean, sorry, your cost of transport goes down, right? Your efficiency goes up, essentially, as you increase the size, okay? So our goal was to try to beat the jellyfish. And I'll show you some of our cost of transport numbers later. We're way off. Look, this is like 0 0.7, 0 
0.7 joules per kilogram per meter. Okay. We, I don't know if I, the punch, the best we could do was like tens of joules per kilogram per meter. Okay. So we were still very far from being able to match the jellyfish. Here are some, uh, uh, here's video. Actually, the drawings are, are from uh, Ken. He was, still is, a, a, a brilliant master's student. Okay, so he drew these. But um, he's, uh, what, what he's talking about are kind of different. It's a little bit of a history of what people were thinking with jellyfish. So the early efforts were saying that, uh, were more on studies of, of jet propulsion in jellyfish. And the efficiencies or the cost of transports that they were calculating were not very high, or not very low. The cost of and they were not very efficient. Okay, I'm going to get this confused multiple times. But as they kept working, and, and PNAS is a top-notch journal, okay, they got to the point where they, as they observed the cycle of the, of the jellyfish's propulsion mechanisms, they said, wow, this thing um, and I show, I'll show another graph in a second, has, a, has, an, has an interesting way of achieving efficient locomotion. So essentially what it does okay, is it flaps its bell down, all right, and it creates what's called a starting vortex, okay, which comes off like this, and it goes down. Okay? And then it comes up, and that bell kind of does, I can't do it, my arms are not so great. Um, but it comes up, and it creates what's called a stopping vortex, which has the opposite orientation, okay? And this stopping vortex, as the bell is right, just relaxed, the stopping vortex hits it, and it causes another increase in acceleration or velocity of the jellyfish. So that cycle looks like what you see here. The jellyfish initially goes very fast during the contraction. Then when it opens up, it slows down, because this is velocity, all right? And then when that stopping vortex comes and hits it in the underside, it gets a boost, okay? Just like that. And so we saw these, and we're like, okay, we want to make a jellyfish that can do this. That's our goal. And it would be nice if it were with a very low cost of transport, okay? So here's work from Priya and, uh, and Alex Villanueva uh, from Virginia Tech. And they, um, they were using shape memory alloys and their the robots to do this type of work. And um, they uh, actually, and then, uh, actually, no, which one is theirs? Okay, this is theirs. Yeah, yeah, these two are theirs. Um, and then uh, this is from Kid Parker at, uh, at Harvard and his group. And they actually put, um, uh, like uh, mouse cells, I believe, I believe they were, on, on silicone, and they would give an electric pulse and it caused it to contract. Right? And um, Virginia Tech was, because it was a big project that they were working on together, they were mostly concerned with, uh, and, and they were working uh, with others, not at Virginia Tech, but Rhode Island and um, uh, Stanford, and they were uh, interested, or Caltech, um, sorry, sorry for your, uh, yeah, and they were, um, uh, they were interested in being able to get the, uh, uh, the, the mimicry, okay, shall we say. This is one of our approaches. What Kevin came up with was a way to create an artificial muscle. So this is silicone up here, okay, and you can see the, the whitish and the bluish actually are both silicone. So it's a completely soft uh, design, and we, 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 we put a bellows underneath, Okay, that would be inflated hydraulically. So you put water in there, uh, and, and, initial, and sometimes we did air, but air was complicated because if you put air in the system, then it would cause it to have an increased buoyancy, and, the, and that's not fair. Because if I really want the jellyfish to go straight up, and I start it low, just inject some air, and then that, that's a pretty good way to do it. But that's not what we're going for here, right? Um, and so what's cool about this design is that when you inflate the bellows, it pulls the strings, and that is like the muscle tightening up. And you get 
a pretty nice contractive looking behavior. Right? But then when you pull the bellows in quickly, the strings go loose and then you've got just the structure that is going to kind of gently go back up, akin to how your muscle would contract and then relax. So uh, these were our initial experiments in the D-Wing. And you see that we have a tank, we have this jellyfish, and there are actually some fi fi they're fishing lines. So it wasn't, the, the jellyfish was not completely untethered. I'll show you a later experimental setup. Okay, but it wasn't completely untethered. We kind of wanted it to go along. But the initial results were very promising. Okay, so what you see here, okay, the jellyfish contracts, and then you see these vortices being shed off, and that opens up and you see vortices coming in. This is a little bit hard, yeah, you can kind of see it there, right? That this looks kind of like what we're trying to achieve. And um, when we look at, uh, so the PIB, and this is, okay, if you're ever interested in starting a research group, it's not bad to be able to do cheap experiments. So normally people have like lasers, like you talk to Professor DeMauer, right, he'll, he'll has a really nice particle image, uh, velocimetry, uh, image velocimetry system, okay, and his is for the supersonic wind tunnel, of course. Um, and, you know, he's seeding particles in air, right, but the basic idea is that you need particles and then you look at how they go and you can say, okay, that's how the fluid is moving. Right? That's the basic idea. So here we have the tank. We put a bunch of glitter on the surface. Uses a, we use a, a regular video camera and we're tracking how the glitter is moving. Okay. And you see the starting vortices. We see stopping vortices and we're very excited. Okay. And when we look at our profiles, we're also very excited. There seemed to be one gate that did something like, well, something like this, right? So this is displacement, and this is speed, right? And remember, De Beers, uh, or uh, Gemmel's work uh, is looking at speed. So we see a burst, and we see slowing down, and then nothing, all right? And here in this case, all right, so this is one kind of gate, and then this is another gate, where we see kind of burst, and then uh, maybe, you know, maybe you see this little burst kind of similar to what you saw with the actual jellyfish. So we were, we were excited, but this, this work wasn't really done rigorously enough to, to like go ahead and publish it, all right? And I'll say we were, I let <laughs> uh, uh, perfection become the enemy of good enough. Okay, so I really wanted us to get this thing figured out in terms of, okay, are we meeting the cost of transport numbers of an actual jellyfish? Okay, can we beat the jellyfish at its cost of transport? Not just get the profile to look right. You know, at multiple steps in this process, we probably should have said, let's, let's stop, let's take a breath and publish the paper. Okay, but we didn't. And then this is just highlighting these, these gates. All right, now, so look, what does this look like? This looks like the lab you're going to get to do. All right, we're gonna do a fluid structure interaction lab. All right, it hasn't been posted yet, I understand. But this is in console, all right? And in this case, what we've got is uh, a, a rubbery piece of material. Okay, that we're causing to flap against the water. Okay? And we're trying to see, hey, are we able to create these vortices? Like, we're not CFD professionals, but are we able to create this? And this is kind of the first foray into using um, COMSOL, using uh, finite element in this case. Uh, well, in our case, we'll be using fluent, and we won't be, and we will just be putting a fluid flow past the material, and so it will be kind of a, a passive uh, response, okay? But this is kind of our early interactions with uh, Fauna Allen. And Kevin, or Kay, was, was really, uh, he was very experimentally minded. 
So what he did here is he took a hard piece of rubber and a soft piece of rubber and he just put some glitter in a bucket and then he would start flapping it and he wanted to see am I able to create these soft and starting vortices like I see with the jellyfish All right and again not exactly you know super scientific okay but depending on how he moved that flat with the hard and the soft material combined right he was able to see what we would consider to be the starting and stopping vortices Okay? And this is not too dissimilar from what you might expect with a fish as well. All right? So a lot of people study fish and vor uh, vortex streets, or von Harman streets, uh, of the vortices that are shed there. Okay? So this is a little more advanced, okay? still not quite there, right? but you're starting to see at least we got somewhat of a geometry okay? for the, that jellyfish flapping. And uh, then it's, you know, we're able to kind of see these, these vortices. We're not seeing the vortices really uh, go in a long series. They kind of come and go, all right? But actually, that's not too irregular, right? If you think about vortex shedding off an airfoil or vortex shedding underwater, right, they can dissipate. We have viscosity. So these vortices don't just go on forever. They, they eventually, um, they get smaller and smaller and they break up, okay? Okay, and then we started talking about like different, so the other one was called like one one. So one stopping vortex, one, uh, one, one, or one starting vortex, one stopping vortex. And then we, we got into some of these things we were talking about an initial, uh, or a starting, starting initial stopping, then a second stopping, and then um, a, uh, an, an initial starting. So like essentially shedding two vortices of each type at a time. All right, and this is just by changing the gate, right? Just by changing how he's flattening the, the, the fin. All right, and then right here we're getting a little bit better. These are these are data, okay, from an experiment, right? And we're starting to get a little bit better, okay, at being able to do the characterization with our um, what we call organized patterning of vortices, OPVs. All right, and we're able to see uh, these different types of uh, starting and stopping vortices being shed and like the two starting to stopping vortices um, depending on the gate we use. Okay. And this is kind of an example of these experiments. Right? So this is not, right, th these experiments might have been showing the, the pattern of the two. You can kind of, it's hard to see, but you can, you can kind of get to a point where you see these two Stopping to starting, but but um, but we're not we're not quite there. Another thing Kevin did, and I'll show you some more of the work we did in simulation and more of the work we did in characterization. But before Kevin graduated, he uh, worked on a an agile jellyfish as well. Okay, so remember we had one input in the previous ones, and now he's got he's got three inputs. Okay, and so. He was able to get the jellyfish, all right, with this different type of system, uh, and applying pressure to all of them. This is a manual operated jellyfish. He's able to get it to move straight, like you see there. Right. It's, it's kind of nice, but this was not. This is just. Let's see if we can make something that looks like an actual jellyfish, all right? And then this is example of us showing the jellyfish. You know, you're actually getting two flaps uh, on one side more than the other, so you're able to get it to change direction. Okay. And, um, and, and so that's, that's, that's where we are up to this point. So this is now around 2017. We started, I think he, uh, he defended in 2016, and so now we're, we're getting into about 2017. And we want to explore the questions involving gates. All right, and we want to say, hey, uh, uh, if I flap at different rates, what type of patterns or vortices am I going to see? And so Kevin kind of outlined these different, uh, different types of patterns that we might be able to, to achieve uh, just by varying the gate. And Lillian came along, and uh, we did more experiments. Now we've, and this, this setup uh, is, 
more complicated and, and based on work that Kevin was doing, I think Kevin was involved in a lot of the design actually of this. But now you see that the jellyfish is in a tank and instead of going sideways, it's, it's moving up and we had to be very careful to make it neutrally buoyant. So that little red clown nose on the end, that's just a float to be able to compensate for the density of the other materials and have it be neutrally buoyant. This design is still using the, the bladder. Um, uh, yeah, this one does use, I think, yeah, for, actually, no, we came up, uh, there was a new version that had like a track and the bellows are, are on this track. And uh, yeah, so, okay, actually, it's not, yeah, 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 in fact, see, there you go. This design um, actually just uses a syringe plunger. Okay, we, we went through a few different designs. So this is a syringe plunger that's been cut and the strings are now attached to it. And here are data, or here's an experiment, a run, okay? And this, this gate doesn't look as exciting as some of the other ones, right? We've, we've seen up to this point, okay? But we decided to, to create three gates that would be fast, moderate, and slow, okay? Just, you know, that, that may not be the best uh, designation, all right, of, of gates. But once again, Lillian was looking at the different types of patterns that we were generating off the ends to get a better understanding. And we were, once again, attempting to get that bump with the stopping vortex. And this was, was this one looks like, this one and this one looks like it's the closest. But what's disappointing, at least as we scaled up uh, this design in some respects, is now we have quite a bit of negative velocity. Okay? So if you look back at the original jellyfish, it didn't really go backwards. Okay? This jellyfish actually, when it opens up, it goes backwards. And yes, it gets a boost okay, from the stopping vortex hitting its underside, but um, it does go backwards. So that's going to lead to some issues with efficiency. I said at the beginning, right, maybe 0.8 joules per kilogram meter was what they measured for Aurita Aurelia. We, okay, our lowest estimate, right, is that if we use the slow um, gate that we had, we could get to about nine. So we were still over it by an order of magnitude. Again, maybe we should just take it back, you know, 10 years later now, or, you know, eight years later, it's like, yeah, we should have probably just like published this, okay? Because we're off by an order of magnitude, but we're kind of the only ones that are measuring these numbers at this point, okay? Um, and we're showing that the gate does matter, which is kind of an intuitive uh, conclusion, right? But we, but, and, and we've learned a little bit about, you know, does it go backwards, does it go forwards? But still, we, we're kind of, what's bothersome here, and it's still bothersome to me, is that we lack uh, uh, understanding, or at least I lack an understanding. And this is probably where it would have been a good time to talk with a biologist, all right, and, and say, okay, what's, what's really going on with these with fluid flows? Nonetheless, we continued. This time, another student came around, and their responsibility, okay, was to run simulations, okay? And this was hard, and these simulations don't look super great, okay? but they are our effort. So uh, before we did that though, he was back using the tank, he came up with a system, and um, I said, oh look, okay, let's just take a piece of silicone and let's flap it around and let's see if we can get the same thing for a piece of silicone that we flap in the tank as we get in our simulations, all right? Sounds simple. That was actually pretty hard, okay? And I don't have all the details here, but you can look at his thesis, but uh, we had to, uh, one of the issues was that if you take this piece of silicone and you just hang it in the air, it's so limp, or it's so, uh, it's so flexible that it just, uh, it, it just hangs down, all right? Underwater, that's not that big a deal, but if you're trying to do characterization out of the water, uh, or if you're trying to like 
characterized as properties, like elastic modulus and various things, that can be problematic. So he did, though, get some data. All right, so it's hard to see, but this is a flap over here. Okay, and these are this is PIV done in the in, the, in our tank. And you can see that there are vortices being shed in opposite directions. Okay, and this is a simulation. Okay, so it looks like we're getting a little bit better, right, than some of our other simulations because at least you can see that these these vortices are carrying off. All right, and. Uh, you know, now we you know more things. In reality, if you want, you know, good, good calculations of lift and drag, you probably want to extend that domain to the right a little bit more. Okay, but you get the idea. And this is an overlay. Okay, where he was trying to overlay his uh, experiments and our and his PIV. Okay, so you can kind of see that there's some correlation. All right, and he's got screenshots showing you this. And these are the displacement data of the tip, okay? And again, you can kind of see, yeah, there's there's some there's some uh, there's some relationship that this seems to be kind of on the right order of magnitude, okay? And then here are his, you know, you've been two D axisymmetric simulations in the class. So here are uh, some data that he collected, all right, where we show. Um, some comparisons to, you know, this is the actual one, right? And this is weird, like, why are there vortices being shed here, 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 and here, right? So he didn't quite figure out everything here, but if you look, we were able to get reasonable results, okay, at the ends, at the tips. Okay? And so this was, this was kind of exciting, and he, and he, finished, his, he finished his masters. And, um, uh, okay, yeah, that's actually, uh, yeah, and oops, okay. Yeah, so here are some screenshots. So he's showing, this is what Lillian showed in her thesis, and this is what I'm showing in my thesis, and please give me a degree. All right, so some takeaways, all right. We were able to create jellyfish vehicles, all right, or actuators that did show the starting and stopping vortices that you might see in an actual jellyfish. There's still a quest out there to demonstrate what we'll call, or what Gamel and Debiri and Priya and others called passive energy recapture. Passive energy recapture is this idea that the stopping vortex hits the underside of the jellyfish and then it continues to propel it forward. Um, we really were fans of bellows, all right? Still a pretty good way to do this. We also use syringes and um, we also explored, you know, how to make something that looks like a jellyfish do something that it would not do normally, which is turn. Okay, I, I don't think many. I mean, they they don't have brains. At least these, this they're not very smart. Okay, but the, the, but it is able to achieve very efficient propulsion. Okay, any thoughts? We're going to talk about some other things, but any thoughts or questions at this point? What? what yes, Aaron. So, yes, I think you stepped in a little bit after I showed the slide. We didn't, but um, Alex Villanueva, who was a graduate student at Virginia Tech, did, and that was one of their ways. The nice thing about shape memory alloys uh, in this particular application is that uh, it's often very hard to get them to relax. You had to heat them up in order to get the shape memory alloys to relax, so you had to cool them. And so since you're underwater, you can get rid of that heat at a at a reason, you know, assuming the water is not hot, you can get it rid of it, uh, you know, pretty easily. But I, they never claimed that they got passive energy recapture either, and I don't, and, and so then, and then he moved on, is my understanding, okay? So yes, that's one way to do it. At the time, I was very much not wanting to do, uh, I, I was trying to avoid hard mechanisms, and then gradually over time, I've become more convinced that with soft robotics, you want to have hybrid systems, okay? You want to, you know, and if you think about how we are as people, as humans, okay? We are uh, skeletal organisms with soft tissue surrounding our hard bones, right? So, you know, that's one way of, of 
of being efficient out of water. In water, you can get away with many cartilaginous um, species, or, or cartilaginous features, better said. Okay. Other thoughts or questions? Okay, we will continue. Um, these are my cartoons for, or actually, did I, I can't remember. Yeah, I think, I think Jing Jin did these, yeah. These, uh, so, you know, we're like, hey, when would you want to use a soft jellyfish? It's to help people, we want to rescue them, right? Has not quite yet. Because we're like, oh, you know, propellers, right? They're going to, you know, potentially be dangerous. Well, if you come see one of our senior design projects, you'll see propellers on the bottom of a surfboard. So, you know, we, we don't completely believe that you need a jellyfish. But maybe a jellyfish-powered surfboard would be interesting. Okay. Not very efficient. Okay. So the next thing we'll talk about in, this is one of the guest lecture videos. So I'll be brief here, but you can watch this if you haven't already. Remember, you, need, you get to do four of these uh, from the different faculty members who have, who have provided them. But this is just our attempt at adjusting lift and drag on an airfoil. Okay? So our idea here was that, is that um, airfoils have a lot of uh, moving parts in them. Okay? And uh, to control the flaps on them, you know, you've got a hydraulic system, you've got, you know, different aspects that you're, you're, um, you're, you're different pieces. And wouldn't it be nice if we could kind of make a nice continuous shape, right? So there's no gap um, in the airfoil itself, right, from where the flap uh, has to return, you know, to its position. And at the time, when you looked at the literature, and I guess I don't have a slide on this, but, um, the airfoils that we were seeing that use some type of uh, inflatable business were like something that was like a Goodyear blimp kind of thing. And it was, it's cool. It works, right? But it was kind of one configuration, one shape, right? So you inflate it, and that's it. And that's not too dissimilar from what you see with, uh, uh, with the airfoils. That, anyone, anyone kite surf? I wish I kite surfed. Okay. Well, anyway, they have the leading edge that they use for their kites is inflatable, right? So it's just like you inflate it up, pump it up, and that's its size. One of the interesting things about using these elastomers, though, is that we could create shapes that could have their, their size dependent on the pressure that you apply. Okay? And for better or worse, the pressures that we're applying are pretty low. But they are still higher than the pressures for the associated with lift that you would have on an airfoil, okay? So, right, because you could, you could be concerned that uh, if, I, <laughs> if I have these flaps, these pseudo flaps as we'll call them, on an airfoil, that they could end up leading to uh, issues <laughs> in changing their size if there is a, a, a high speed flow going across them, right? Uh, because Okay, so in this case, we tried three different designs. Okay, now, how many, so you guys have done some aerodynamics, right? Some of you are in aerodynamics? Compressible, okay. So if you saw these three designs up there, which of these might result in some type of increase in coefficient of lift? So we have A, B, C, right? We have the opportunity to put something on the, the trailing edge on the bottom. The opportunity to put something on the top front portion, okay, near the leading edge, that's C. And then we have some, an opportunity to put something on the bottom front portion. So any ideas? Yes. What are your hypotheses here? Would it be the trailing edge? Yes. So what is that most? That's mostly, can you said flap, right? 
Yeah, so that's most akin to what you have with the flap, right? And we talked about this a little bit when we did airfoils, right? That as you increase the camber, all right, so you make it more asymmetric, right? You can have a greater lift, a greater coefficient of lift at zero angle of attack. Um, so, yeah, so that might have some interesting positive, quote, positive, right? We try not to be subjective as engineers, but that could increase our, lift, our coefficient of lift. Okay, what about the other ones? Okay, so the pseudo flap, that one looks like a flap, the one on the trailing edge on the bottom. What about some of these other geometries? Any ideas? Have you ever seen an airfoil that has something like this on the front of it? That like, like go, go out like that? Maybe, okay. I mean like, other than that, that like in everything, they kind of jet out and increase the cord length. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so they increase the cord length, yeah. This is not really increasing the cord length. This design, really is not very beneficial at all, okay? <laughs> like, I don't see many salient attributes for it, okay? This design, it turns out, does have some interesting effects. And it's just like the inverse of that, right? So I guess maybe flip us down. But um, what, what you'll see is that these types of ladders on the front, well, they're not ladders, but these types of uh, structures that are put on the front, they can actually delay stall. So what does, that, what does that mean? That means that uh, you can actually get to a higher angle of attack before you stall. Okay? And uh, so they, they can kind of promote uh, or, or inhibit separation, as they say, in the lingo. All right? And look, we did ANSYS way back then. We did ANSYS. Okay? Does this look familiar? I didn't do it. The graduate student did it. This is Jing Jin Shi. He was amazing. He's in K-Epsilon, right? Reynolds number, this is a low Reynolds number, right? For an airfoil, 10 to the fourth, okay? And um, we use the CH form for the mesh. Da 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 da, right? That's, that's what a lot of you are probably doing, are doing, okay? And what we did in the class as well. And then these are um, uh, different angles of attack, all right? And different uh, inflated sizes for the bladders and just showing pressure distributions, which we didn't really do here in our class. Right? We just looked at the overall uh, lift and drag coefficients. Okay. And uh, then we went to the, uh, uh, we did some experience in the large subsonic tunnel, all right, in the D-wing, but really a lot of the data we collected was just in the small ones that you, would, that you use in your labs, okay? But we put in our, our fancy little airfoils. coefficient of lift to the coefficient of drag, all right? Um, of course, you might not always be running at this low air speed, okay, five meters per second, but um, if you are able to uh, essentially increase the efficiency during cruise, that could be beneficial. 
Okay. And then we have this, we tried some things where we were like, hey, we can try to inflate multiple bladders at the same time and see if we get any positive results. And in this case, don't inflate this bottom front, and, but maybe you can inflate this end, and maybe you can inflate that one. Right? And you can see the coefficient, the lift and coefficient drag. Okay. And um, we also made a little sailboat. This we did do in the subsonic, the larger subsonic wind tunnel. Right? So just demonstrating that if you um, uh, are going to inflate one side, right, that the lift then pushes it to the other side, right? Um, I don't have the data in here, but if you look at the paper, right, which we published, you can see that, in fact, inflating the top front one did uh, delay stall a little bit. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, we, we were still, still, if someone has an application for this, we, we worked with some people, I guess, now they would have, they, they, uh, are you airborne, I guess? We, uh, we got a plane and they did some experiments trying to put these on a plane. That was a, that was a complicated feat. But how we, we didn't really collect the data um, in a way, but the, the guy was able to fly it. We didn't crash the plane because we had our pseudo flaps on it. Okay, but other than that, I can't really tell you much. Okay. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about that. Okay, and that, that was published. That, that one was actually published. All right. The last project, any questions, any thoughts on that one? Anyone has like a million dollar, billion dollar killer app? <laughs> All ears. Huh? Flying skateboard. A flying skateboard? You want a hoverboard? <laughs> very safe. Yeah, very safe. Very safe indeed. Okay. So the last project I was thinking about involves rotary actuators. Okay. That's a fancy way of saying motor, but a, a, a rotating motor. Okay. And up to the point when we were doing this work, uh, soft robots were able to roll, okay, but they were not necessarily, um, they didn't have wheels, okay? They didn't have a wheel and axle configuration. And can you think of any animal that has a wheel and axle configuration? No, why, why has nature not created the wheel and the axle? You got a what? You got to evolve like small steps at a time and the wheel and axle is not useful until, until it's complete. complete. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You got round animals that can roll, but that's about it. Yeah, so pangolins roll, right? So so some animals they roll, but a wheel and axle is gonna be tricky for biology, right? Because uh, if you want nutrients, in order to build a structure, right, you need to have a way of getting nutrients for Yes, right? And the very principle of a wheel and axle is that they slip against each other and they're not connected, right? So you need some type of animal that would like grow a wheel about an axle and then kill. You could have two and wheels. You could have two wheels have an umbilical cord on one that winds up, when it's wound up, you lift it off the ground and twist it and throw on the other one. Switch back. Right, right. So, uh. <laughs> So nature has not evolved to this point, right? Okay. Um, but we thought, wouldn't it be neat? And this is, again, Kevin. So the same guy that did the jellyfish work, the early jellyfish work, he had this idea. And then another master's student, another master's student um, pursued it. Okay. And so we're going to see a lot of work from Shang Yu Gong, all right, who is uh, now a postdoc. Not here, but he's at uh, Yale. So the idea here uh, is that can we create something that essentially uses peristalsis, okay, but around a wheel, okay, to then induce rotation. So we have a rotor and stator. We call them type one and type two. One type is where the rotor is internal, and the other type is where the rotor is external. Okay, so a wheel 
is going to be something where the rotor is going to be external and the stator inside is kind of fixed, right? And the other type is more like a winch, all right, where you've got the uh, external stator, but then you've got an internal rotor, okay, that spins. So, um, at this point in time, so this is back, I guess, around 2016 or so, 2000, the, um, the state of the art in soft robotics was really focused on bending, okay, bending or extending uh, mechanisms. Right. And um, there were some rolling robots, okay, there were some origami, there's still a lot of origami stuff, we've done some origami stuff too, all right, and, uh, but what about soft wheels and joints? And what would the potential be? Well, maybe pulleys, maybe, you know, machines that have their suspension built into the wheel itself, right? The wheel could be tuned to have the right elasticity okay, to be able to navigate over rough terrain. And, uh, yeah, oh, okay, this is old. These are old slides, okay? But it was published in advanced materials. Okay, and these are the two different types of actuators. Thank you, uh, Shani, sorry, I, I got up, I gave you all the slides. All right, so uh, in type one, all right, these, the stator is on the outside, and then there's a rotor on the inside, not pictured, and we would inflate these sets of bladders at the same time. And you can see that they're kind of rotating and they could induce rotation. So here is the rotor on the inside, the stator on the outside, and here's the rotor on the outside, and the stator on the inside that has the and then we had to, you know, get the timing right for the inflation of these different bladders. And there was a lot of molding, a lot of tubing, a lot of work, okay, in, in getting, this, getting this thing together. In fact, a couple of years after this, we did a demonstration and Wu Bing Kim, who's an uh, undergrad, he had quite the task to get this to work again. Okay, it was quite the task. All right. And then there's also the use of different types of lubricants between the, uh, the stator and the rotor to be able to get a kind of smooth transition. We did some characterization of material properties and, and we also looked at how these things inflated and we also did look. Finite element. Whoa, right? Again, something you could do now. And uh, it turns out, okay, that these bladders. Has anyone used a, one of those poppets? What? The poppet things? They, they're like a fad. The fidgets. Like, like put them inside out and then you wait and they spring back up? Okay, that's one way, yes. No, no, no. They're, you know, I guess they're elementary school things. They're like these little bubbly things that you pop both either way. Yeah, yeah they have... Huh? It's a toy. A, what's it called? A fidget toy. A fidget toy, yes. A fidget toy, right? So that exhibits what's called an inelastic, or it's at an elastic stability, an elastic instability. It's just like buckling, right? The, the poppet goes one direction, it's buckled that direction, and it goes the other direction, it's, it, it buckles the other direction, okay? So there's, a sim, there's an interesting instability that you also see with balloons. Has anyone ever tried to blow up a balloon? Has anyone, is anyone not good at blowing up balloons? Okay, that's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, so like, you, you're, you got the balloon and you, you're like trying to get it to expand and you, you blow and what happens? It's, it just, if you, if you're, if you have not the ability to do it, right, it just like stays really small, okay? But there's this sudden moment where you're blowing hard and go poof, right? And it's now at that, at that once you've reached, once you've gone past that elastic instability, it's very easy to inflate. Okay? So that was the same thing we were seeing with our little bladders. Okay, you inflate them, and it's hard to get them to inflate, and then they go poof, right? They kind of burst, and this is a pressure volume curve. So what does that mean? That means 
that, and you can kind of see it here. This is my infection. This is like, this is one of those things where like, okay, Xiang Yu, this is what I want you to show. <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> All right? <laughs> and so uh, we did these experiments. Actually, I think Jing Jin did these experiments afterward uh, to satisfy the reviewers um, that, uh, in fact, yes, we do have this elastic instability. All right? So we're going up in pressure. We're going up linearly in time, going up linearly in volume. Okay? And then we get to this instability, and then suddenly we get a lot of expansion in volume without having to apply much more pressure. Okay, just like the blowing the balloon effect. This is a problem though, because uh, how structurally sound are balloons? Mm, yeah, not the bestest, right? I mean, you have inflatable balloons and you know, hot air balloons and all that kind of stuff, right? That's a little bit different category. But as you, as you expand the material this much, it can lead to having a, a thin membrane, right? And that can lead to potential issues. Okay, so this is just showing the inflation of a bladder, all right? So you see the syringe applying the volume, all right? And then it inflates. Wow, is that exciting? Okay, and then this is showing a really fast motor. 13 RPMs, guys. Yeah, you wanna put that in your you're a, you're cheap, huh? <laughs> no, no, maybe, maybe not, right? Um, and then what we showed here is that we could. Um, oh, I, I guess I don't have the videos here, but this is. Oh, maybe I do, right? So this is a uh, an example. Now we've got our the, the rollers on the inside, and the stator has got those inflatables, okay, on the outside. And then it's doing good old soft robotic technology of picking up an object or grabbing an object. So we don't have inflation coming, the pressure coming through the, this tube actually. This is just a string. And then it is able to uh, pick it up. I think it will pick it up. This will pick it up. It will pick it up. Whoop! Oh no. Okay, let's skip ahead. Yes, it did pick it up. Okay. And then the fun stuff. You guys, you all have done some torque speed curves probably, right? Measurements, some, some lab? Okay, so here's a question for you. Why do electric vehicles work so well? Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's that's an, I don't even know what that means, but that's interesting. What do you mean by that, Aaron? I could be wrong, but I feel like I remember somebody mentioning something about one of the reasons they're good at stuff is because, like, with the electrical power, it can be an on-off. Like, they can immediately go from zero power to whatever amount of power they want. They, there's not like a like a build-up period. That can be completely separate. <sighs> okay, that's interesting. I mean, you. You can, theor and like, if you have a resistor and you run uh, electric current through it, yeah, okay, you can dissipate heat pretty quickly at different, at different rates, okay? What were you gonna say? Okay, okay, okay. So, most motors, including, Okay, uh, uh, electric motors, right? They have a peak frequent, a peak um, speed of efficiency, right? So if you take out the internal combustion engine, the goal is for it to be running at some RPM, all right, so that it has very high uh, power production and is efficient, okay? What happens at low RPMs for an internal combustion engine in terms of torque? You have to shift gears. You have to shift gears, all right? That's the answer. That is the answer, okay? <laughs> so there are, I, I can't remember the number, but there's something like 2,000 moving parts, 
in a, in a uh, in an internal combustion engine, all right, moving parts, all right. When you or, or in a transmission slash, and you know the rotor, the the moving parts in a car that's powered by gas is something like hundreds or a couple thousand moving parts. Whereas the people who pitch electric vehicles, I wasn't planning to talk about this. Someone fact check me on this, will you? Just so that we get this straight. My understanding is there are about 17 moving parts in an electric vehicle, okay? Why is that? It's because of because this. They replaced all the physical buttons with touch screens. <laughs> Those are not the moving parts. <laughs> Those are not the moving parts. I'm talking about related to actual. It's because you have the down, their windows have a button. Very clever. Yeah, that's all I'll say. Okay, so um, the, what happens with uh, electric motors is that if you look at, anyone heard of torques? Anyone do any RC, RC car or RC drone or RC anything? Yes, you do. Okay. Have you ever spec out a motor? Like, so when you're like, hey, I want to get a cool motor for my car. Okay, this is the one that came out. Okay, well, anyway. You're talking about like brushless motors? Yeah, like so brushless motors, right? What you'll see is that they give you something called, and it may be like they have KV or they have different terms, um, but they'll have essentially, you can figure out what is called a torque speed curve. And a torque speed curve is a little bit of a misnomer, okay? Because it's really a line, okay? It's really a line, okay? This is torque. Speed. Okay, it goes like that. This is cool. This is why you don't need to shift gears. When you are accelerating, what do you need? Yeah, well, yes, you need power. You need torque. Okay, you need torque to get going. So it turns out that these electric motors, at low speeds, they have high torque. Okay, and then the torque lowers. Now, if you take Okay, so here's a, a, a PhD qualifying exam. Actually, it's not, well, it is. It was a minor qualifying exam. What's the relationship between torque and speed? Linear. Oh, okay. Yes, here for the electric motor. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was the bad. See, I can't even give a good question. Power equals torque times uh, RPM, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So power is equal to torque times omega. Okay. So if I said that this is like, if I have like a, some type of NX plus B here, okay, you can do this out. If I calculate the power now as a function of speed, right, you get a parabola that looks something like this. Okay, so you still want to be operating at a particular speed, like a, a certain high speed for high efficiency. Okay, well actually, high power. And it turns out that the efficiency, the maximum efficiency is like usually somewhere around the peak in power as well, okay? But, um, but, this is, but this is why you don't need, or the torque speed curve for electric motors is why you can get away with fewer moving parts. Or one of the reasons why you can't get, I mean you also don't have the pistons, the camshafts, and all that stuff, right? So that's another thing that you don't have to worry about, okay? Um, so anyway, so we, we did the characterization for the torque speed because we wanted to say this is like a really cool motor. And then you get to see things that we did really like these two new vehicles with a little like dragging thing. Alright. And this is just Sean Yu uh, playing around uh, with the controller. Right? Showing that we could go around. Okay, and then this is just us trying to do some speed tests. Okay, so we can give you kind of a four wheel vehicle. And look, the whole thing is rubbery, right? So it's just like, vroom, 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 vroom. All right. Now, Jack. What did you say? It looks like someone doesn't know how to drive a stick. <laughs> hey, I hadn't thought about that, but that's true, okay? Um, and then also, we're trying to show hey, you can go over rocks. Okay, you can go in water. There are no metal parts in this. Right? There are no magnets, no metal parts. Okay? And we're just kind of like cruising along. 
Okay. And the other thing is, what about <laughs> drop drop tests, right? So if you do a drop test, you wouldn't want to drop your car from that many times its height, okay? But because it's rubbery, you know, it, it able it's able to withstand that kind of fall. And then, of course, I wanted us to do this, right? I wanted this is the test I wanted to work, but. Um, I think poor Sean Yu was like, you are such a goof, you're making me kill my machine, right? And then he pushed it over. All right? All right, so, and the wheel came off. You see that the wheel came off on the bottom? Yeah, yeah, okay. So anyway, the, we did publish this work. This work received some attention. Um, it was in 2017 in Advanced Materials. Um, it was a lot of fun. The press had a little fun with it too. Okay, so just to conclude, soft robotics. It's now a field. So lately, I was I was uh, signing this thing like this little survey thing to review for a journal, and now they have like like they say, hey, what's your expertise? And now they have a little field that says soft robotics. I guess it's been like that for a little while, and then like different areas of soft robotics. So this field emerged essentially after 2009. Um, fluid soft material inter interaction. So you're going to get a taste of this in the lab, but you know, it's, it's not that, it's, it's fun. It's fun in lab. It's hard to do in practice, okay? It's very hard. And it's actually very hard to simulate accurately, okay? I don't think I'm going to have a, um, you know, I've been trying to give you good baby step metrics to compare to. For this lab, I don't, imagine I'm going to have a very good um, comparison for you. Sorry. Okay. But it'll be fun. It'll be short. It'll be short as well on Wednesday for you. Um, jellyfish. If you create an efficient jellyfish, please let me know. Okay? I'm still curious about this. If someone else has done it, done it let me know that as well. Oh, well, the jellyfish, the enemy of good enough is perfection. Alright? Someone, I think, said that, right? I was so stuck on trying to be perfect here um, that we just we missed multiple off ramps on the highway to publish it in a, a peer reviewed journal. Airflow is elastomeric, elastomeric actuators. I'll say I was naive, right? I was like, this is awesome, we can control lift and drag on an airfoil. Well, I don't have a big check for licensing that technology yet. All right? Maybe there's still potential, right? We filed a patent. Um, I think we filed it. Yeah. Oh, did we not file a patent on that one? No, I don't think we filed a patent on that one. We did file a patent on the rotor actuators. I'm still also waiting for a big check for that one. But that one hasn't happened. Okay. So some of these ideas, they're fun. Okay. But there are some technical issues. Reliability, for example, for the rotary actuators. Okay. Um, this work was made possible by a bunch of students. Okay, they toiled, they sweat. We are up late working in the lab or doing things together. Mostly them, but I was up late too. And, um, and so it, it's fun, it's, it's nice to be able to talk about these things and it's nice that um, I'm less stressed than I was then uh, during this period of time, right? And of course, we've got to thank Parker's for supporting us. Um, let's, uh, any questions before we, uh, before we, we uh, terminate here? Would they spend Tuesdays out uh, afterwards? What's that? $2 Tuesdays. Did they get to enjoy them? What are $2 Tuesdays? <laughs> well, that's fine. Okay, I don't know. All right. Any, any technical questions? Any thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you. I hope that you've enjoyed the... The, the content for this class, all right? I really do. It's been fun to get to teach it, all right? And